Films in Focus with David Sterrett is underwritten by The Movie House, your destination for first-run Hollywood and independent movies, and a digital portal to the Met Opera, National Theater Live, and special events worldwide in Millerton, New York, and on the web, themoviehouse.net. David Sterrett is the editor-in-chief of the Quarterly Review of Film and Video, contributing writer at Cineast, film professor at the Maryland Institute College of Art, and Robin Hood Radio's very own critic. He joins us weekly, the films The Whale, Avatar, The Way of Water, and No Bears. Did you like my recitation? Hi, David. How are you? It was a wonderful recitation, Jill, and I'm doing just fine. Hope you are the same. Absolutely. Okay. Well, uh, let us get to these movies, which have been out for a little while now, but uh, they are movies that people are, well, at least in a couple of cases, definitely going to see. Uh, and I know there's curiosity about them, and I only wish that I liked a couple of these movies more. I'm going to be a little bit grinchy again today, because uh, I didn't particularly take to The Whale or Avatar The Way of Water, but let me expand on that a bit, if I may. Uh, the Whale uh, is certainly an interesting movie in conception. It was directed by Darren Aronofsky, who is a very considerable filmmaker. And one of the things that interests me so much is that um, his previous film, which was called Mother, was phenomenally invented. It was a strange movie, a true act of really daring creativity. And one of the things about The Whale is that it is absolutely just lays there on the screen as far as I'm concerned. I see very, very little cinematic creativity in it at all, and that's one of the big problems with it. But let's back up a little bit here. The Whale is about a guy named Charlie who is morbidly obese. He is really, really enormous, and of course there are all kinds of terrible health problems that come with that. And he, uh, he, he, is, he is so obese that he can't really even stand up very effectively. I can't do much of anything. And here, uh, apparently, uh, Brendan Fraser, by the way, who does a heroic job playing this character, uh, spent hours every day before the cameras rolled getting all fixed up with his prosthetics and so forth. This is not digital manipulation that we are seeing. It is real, what they call practical effects. It is real prosthetics, real material added to his body. So it's an impressive performance in its way, at least on that sort of level, on the level of, uh, of just looking very different in most ways or in many ways from the way Brendan Fraser normally looks in the movies. Anyway, his name is Charlie, the character, and he is this morbidly obese guy and he sits around in his living room all day and he teaches uh, an online English course, some sort of extension course apparently, uh, where he does not even allow himself to be shown in the, the online Zoom uh, uh, images. Uh, he keeps his camera off so that his students won't know what he looks like. Uh, and that's what he does. So into this situation, uh, various complications come almost immediately. Uh, one thing is that we meet his only friend who is a nurse named Liz, and she uh, comes by regularly and looks after him, and she tries so much to get him to take a little bit of care of himself. He, In addition to his obesity, he has congestive heart failure, uh, and so he is actually, he could sort of die at any moment. So Liz takes care of him and wishes that he would go to a hospital and that sort of thing. Uh, he also has a daughter, uh, a teenager named Ellie, from whom he has been estranged for many years. And he has been wanting to get back together with her, and she does come by, and she they, they set up the sort of a deal where he is going to help her with an essay that she needs to write for school, and in exchange for that, she will, in fact, spend time with him, which she has to keep secret from her mother because she is totally estranged from Charlie. Uh, and so, anyway, she's another very major character character in this film. And then a third major character is a young man named Thomas, who is some sort of evangelical missionary who comes by to try to give the word of God to Charlie uh, and ends up getting into a relationship with Charlie's daughter, Ellie, etc., etc. So these are our main characters, Charlie, his nurse who looks after him, his daughter who has been estranged and now starts coming by, although it remains an extremely prickly relationship. And then this young man who comes by as a missionary and then keeps coming by, uh, as a friend of Charlie and as a sort of a, uh, oh, a possible romantic partner for Ellie, the teenage daughter. So that's what it's about. Now, here's the big problem with The Whale. The Whale takes place virtually every single moment of it 
in Charlie's one room, his living room. There's a little bit that gets outside that room, but not very much. Now, I have nothing against a movie that takes place entirely in one setting. I will now give three examples of really, really, really good movies that take place entirely in one setting, all made by the great Alfred Hitchcock. His movie Lifeboat, which takes place entirely on a lifeboat. His movie Rope, which takes place entirely in an apartment. And his movie Dial M for Murder, which takes place largely within a single apartment. So it can be done. It can be done with great success. Uh, This is where we get back to my point about this movie having absolutely no visual, no cinematic imagination, whatever. It uses this single room, more or less, of Charlie's home uh, in the most boring, dull way possible. There's a front door and people come in and out the front door. It's like one of those sitcom front doors uh, where people come in and out all the time. It's like that. It's not handled with any imagination, whatever. Uh, anyway, it's just sort of this dull, dull stuff. No, just nothing to look at in this movie aside from Charlie. And he is really not all that pleasant to look at. So I really did not take to the whale. Well, it's gotten very uh, mixed reviews. Some people love it. Some people hate it. It. I am closer to the latter category than that. I just want to mention the title does not only refer to the large size of Charlie, it also refers to Moby Dick, which is, of course, the subtitle of that is The Whale, the great American novel, in my opinion. Uh, and that plays a part in the story. Charlie does teach writing, and there are a lot of references to Moby Dick throughout the film. The end of the film is this sort of over-the-top mystical thing, which did not persuade me at all. So people are enjoying, many people, not all people, are enjoying The Whale very much more powerful or to them, I say, myself, I found it a pretty dull experience, just not interesting at all. Our second movie, oh, it's overloaded with visuals, Avatar, The Way of Water, <laughs> but they were not visuals that, that, that appealed to me very much, I'm afraid. Uh, so again, I'm, I'm being grinchy today, but that's just the way it turns out. Uh, Avatar uh, is, of course, a, Avatar, The Way of Water is a sequel to Avatar, which came out way back in 2009 and was a very extravagant science fiction movie that takes place on the moon of another planet. And it has all kinds of interstellar creatures and it has humans and aliens and they're all interacting with each other and all of that. One of the things that about Avatar, the original Avatar, that struck me was here we have all this futuristic stuff made with all the resources of 21st century cinematic technology. And yet the movie seemed largely interested. I don't mean that it was a main thing in the film, but strangely interested in people shooting bullets at each other. Uh, It ends up being a sort of a World War II movie in part, despite all this hugely futuristic and high tech stuff. And that struck me as a way in which the movies tend to be stuck in their old, old patterns, even when they seem to be acting on the boldest of new frontiers. And I felt a little bit the same way about Avatar The Way of Water. So now we have a main character of the Avatar series. It's now turning into a series, uh, Jake Sully. And uh, he is living on this moon of another planet, uh, this place called Pandora. And, uh, oh, I'm not going to try to get into the plot. People can look that up. But it has all kinds of stuff with the sky people and the the fights between uh, the earth people and the various extraterrestrial people and so forth and so on. It's also a family story because Jake does have his family now uh, and they play a big part in the movie and there's of course the Navi race uh, which he is now living with and he has Jake has to work with them to protect their home from an invasion. So that's what it's all about. Now, I went to the trouble of seeing Avatar The Way of Water in 3D, which is, I think, the way it should be seen. Avatar was also in 3D, and I thought it used 3D reasonably effectively. I have to say the 3D of Avatar The Way of Water struck me as absolutely bland. It just wasn't very interesting. It was not exciting. So my personal advice is, if it's easy if you see this movie, uh, whether it's going to be eventually streaming or in a movie theater where it's not in 3D, it's not going to make much difference because I thought the 3D was really kind of dull. Also, the color of the movie I found really kind of dull. Not interesting 3D, not interesting color. Some of the imagery was interesting, But the plot is sort of an old fashioned movie style conflict, fighting wars between different people plot. And then if the color and the 3D don't work very well, you just don't have a very interesting movie. So Avatar The Way of Water, despite all of this high tech excitement that it's supposed to have, just sort of sort of like the whale, just sort of lay on the screen for me. It couldn't be more different from the whale in that the whale takes place in a room and Avatar takes place in another planet. And it has all these places people go and all 
all these exciting water scenes and all of that. Uh, but my gosh, it just never generated any excitement for me at all. And it is way over three hours long. So Avatar The Way of Water is the kind of futuristic fantasy that many people will enjoy enormously. And once again, I say more power to them. But for me, the disappointment of the movie's technical aspects. Uh, James Cameron, by the way, was the, uh, the, the director and co-writer of this movie. Again, he's the great guru of the Avatar franchise. Uh, he is a person who has a lot of imagination. Titanic remains a fairly memorable movie in its own way. But here, I just felt the movie never generated any experience excitement for me at all. It was just another science fiction movie, a big and sprawling one to be sure, but not inspired in my opinion. So now, Jill, after being a big Grinch here for a while, let me get to a movie that I really loved. I think it's one of the very, very, very best of this past year, and I hope that it spreads far and wide and that many people get to see it in this new year. Uh, and if they have to see it streaming when it shows up that way, a perfectly good way to see it. It's not a huge, gigantic spectacle. It's kind of an intimate movie, but it's a spectacular movie, and that is No Bears, written and directed by the great, great, great Iranian director, Jafar Panahi. Now, we hear so many things, and rightly so, about the horrible things that are going on in Iran, and nowadays a bit of hope with all the protests that are going on against a very repressive government there. Uh, but this movie is not political in that sense. But the writer-director of No Bears, Jafar Panahi, has been very much interacting with his own government, the Iranian government. He is one of the greatest of all Iranian filmmakers. Ir Iran has been a great, great source of world-class, superb cinema for the last few decades. I hope people are aware of this. Iran has a lot of huge hugely gifted filmmakers who are making magnificent cinema on a regular basis. And I mean enjoyable magnificent cinema, not just art magnificent cinema. And Jafar Panaki is, is one of the greatest of these. However, he gets into conflicts with his government a lot, and for quite a few years now, he has been banned from making movies. He has made movies anyway and managed to get them out into the world. One of them, by the way, was called This Is Not A Film. So he still keeps doing that. That's part of his creativity. However, just after he finished No Bears, he was arrested by his own government and sentenced to six years in prison, which is where he is right now. They accused him of what they called propaganda against the state. So he is right now in jail in Iran and will presumably be there for some years to come. Yet he finished this movie, No Bears, and it is now out in the world. And I'm not just recommending it because he is a martyr to, to making cinema and to protesting against his own government. Uh, he is it's just a spectacular movie. So in No Bears, Jafar Panahi plays a filmmaker very much like himself. And he, this filmmaker is making a movie near the border with Turkey. And he is trying to do it using uh, online means. He's basically directing it off of his computer. And he's got people over in Turkey, and they've got the camera and so forth. And he is directing the whole operation from where he is in Iran, right near the border. So that's the setup for the movie. Then what happens is one day, he's just out sort of taking a walk, and he, he snaps a little photo of a young couple he sees. And this turns out to be, well, something that plunges him into the middle of a gigantic controversy over whether one young man is actually betrothed to one young woman or not. And apparently the photograph has some evidence which could bear out the truth of this. Only the filmmaker, who is our main character, can't remember ever having taken the photograph. And he can't seem to find the photograph among his digital files. But this becomes a huge controversy between him and the local, the local townspeople. Uh, the title of the film, No Bears, which is only explained very late in the film, refers to the fact that there is a lot of fear. There's a lot of trepidation. There's a lot of anxiety going on in these various situations that we're encountering, and there really shouldn't be any. People should just get along. There shouldn't be any fear. There really are no bears out there. However, uh, that's just what the title moons. The movie itself is just a delightful, small, humanly scaled human drama 
about people involved in situations which have to do with politics very much. The filmmaker in our film can't leave Iran because he is banned pretty much like Panaki from leaving the country, but he's still trying to direct this movie just across the border. And this gets into online filmmaking, which is something that more and more filmmakers are finding themselves having to do these ways, if not for political reasons, then for pandemic reasons. So all of these things come together in this absolutely marvelous little movie. Jafar Panahi is a wonderful actor. He does a wonderful job of playing this character very much like himself. And he is a fabulous filmmaker. And he makes this movie into a funny, ominous, suspenseful human drama that I cannot recommend highly enough. So as far as I'm concerned, people should bypass the whale, they should bypass Avatar The Way of Water, and they should seek out no bears, either right now if it happens to be somewhere near you, or when it shows up streaming, because it is one of the finest movies of 2022, and I hope it lives long into 2023. So that is my only partly Grinchy story this week, Jill. Oh, it's very limited Grinchiness. All right, thank you very much, David stare at limited grinch films in focus the films the whale avatar the way of water and no bears 